Welcome to this talk and a welcome back to Professor Robert Clancy. Professor, thank you for coming back. It's a pleasure, John. You are now well known to this channel, uh, Professor of Pathology, Professor of Medicine, Consultant Physician for decades, uh, published medical researcher and, of course, author. And we've got something really interesting today from, from your clinical work to discuss, Robert. Now, before we do this, sort of the preamble is that typically in the past, people would have published a paper a primary source paper or at least a conversation piece on what we're about to discuss because it is brand new medical information but um, Robert and myself don't need to have publications for our curriculum vitae anymore we're well past that stage so we're actually bringing this di directly via this new medium and we're, we're calling this evidence-based communication. Um, now we're going to give some pretty um, startling findings I think really but in a very positive way but before we do that we just have to stress that we are not prescribing any medications do not carry out any medical interventions on yourself or others based on what we say but we are appealing to doctors and researchers to take this up so Robert what what is the particular patients you've been looking at and what's the particular finding John this particular a chat between you and me has come about because uh, the earlier chat a week or so ago um, looked at long COVID and at the end of that we talked about the possible ways of treatment and I talked a little bit about uh, how I've been managing the patients I see and I, I just want to emphasize that yeah we're not sitting here today uh, talking about uh, how you should treat yourself or someone like you. Well, what we're trying to do is to identify that there are very exciting opportunities to look at ways ahead. And uh, what we're talking about today uh, needs to be picked up by those who have the opportunity to do uh, standard randomised controlled trials, which will be very easy to do for those people running big clinics. Um, I see uh, a limited number of, of patients. So I think that's really important because um, following our last talk, I, I went to work yesterday and I had a pile of emails from really interesting, nice people. And I'm just not in a position where uh, I can provide uh, those people the sort of help they need. And I, I wished I could. So um, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, isn't it? I mean, I, I'm the same. I get so many emails. But of course, you're, you're still a practicing clinician and you get emails from people saying, doctor, please help me. But you're not in a position to help everyone well, it, so it, it that's why we are appealing to all the doctors out there aren't we yeah it, it breaks your heart you, you know you you um and so I, I i think we talked about that and and we said well look maybe there's a way we can uh, provide at least our thoughts on how things go and uh, start a, a conversation and the idea of an evidence-based communication conversation came up as, as probably using modern technology um, to communicate in a way that certainly wasn't available to me when I was um, when I had all the infrastructure with secretaries and registrars and all those people that uh, around me that could uh, pick these mm. ideas up and do something with them. Mm. And we are going to be talking about using ivermectin in long COVID and long COVID post-vaccine syndrome. And I believe what you've found, Robert, in, in your clinical experience is that people who've had post-vaccine injury, even if they are um, nucleocapsid protein uh, antibody negative, in other words, they haven't had the virus, they have a particular presentation. So post-vaccine syndrome has a particular presentation and post-COVID people that have had the COVID infection has a particular presentation and there's a great commonality between these two presentations and they both seem to respond to the same type of treatment approach. Yes, I think that's a very good summary. What we discussed the other day was that there are two syndromes which have great similarities. Uh, there's the syndrome where you get uh, repeated vaccines, uh, the particularly the messenger RNA of vaccines where you get dissemination of the uh, of the genetic material and then dissemination of expression of the spike protein on cells throughout the body and you've got uh, a, sim a very similar syndrome that can occur and much better understood and recognized maybe not understood but certainly recognized uh, which we call long COVID uh, so you in a sense you have post vaccine long COVID mm. and post infection long COVID mm. and certainly it's my experience and, and talking to others it's um, it's other people's experience that those who get the post-vaccine long COVID, uh, for simplicity, uh, 
many of them will go on and, of course, get COVID, they get an exacerbation of near identical symptoms. And so um, there's this commonality of spike protein that appears to be uh, involved. And at the end of the, uh, the talk that we had the other day, I, I very quickly went through some of the ideas that, that I've been treating my patients mm. with. And uh, one of them, uh, which I'm very excited about as a mm. potential, uh, was uh, giving the individuals a, a trial of, uh, of uh, four to six weeks um, ivermectin. Um, now, uh, this is not treating COVID, uh, so we're not talking about ivermectin treating COVID here. Uh, we're talking about the use of a drug which recently, very recently, has been shown to have a high affinity to binding to the spike protein, which is in the vaccine and on, of course, the virus, because that's the attachment part of the virus uh, to enter the cells of the body. Um, uh, and this has been done by uh, a group in, in America, uh, and initially also with a, in, in combination with a group in France. And uh, it was initially uh, developed as an idea, and we're talking about the last few months, when uh, three studies, uh, which I, I was part of one, but a very small part, uh, three studies showed that if you treat patients uh, who have low oxygen saturation um, with this drug, the oxygen saturation increases to normal in most cases within 24 hours, which made no sense if you're suppressing an inflammation. Uh, and this was then taken up by showing that uh, if you take the red cells of you or me or anybody and add a little bit of spike protein, they all clump together. And this, of course, is making a very inefficient process of transferring oxygen from the lungs into the blood. And so the saturation goes down. But if you put small amounts of, of this drug uh, in the test tube, the aggregation either disappears or doesn't happen. Uh, and there, there's a lot of really interesting studies that, that sort of come together when you understand this concept. Mm. For example, people looking at blood flow through small vessels under the tongue uh, have shown that in uh, long COVID, for example, as well as COVID, uh, there's this reduced perfusion, reduced movement of blood through these vessels. They go off to bigger vessels. Um, and when you treat them, uh, it changes. Uh, so it, it's a very exciting concept that, that solid, so, very solid science. Um, and so um, my view was that if this is the case, uh, then let's try treating patients. So I've treated a small number, maybe six, eight patients. Uh, and they've all had pretty much the similar results. Um, and, um, you know, it, it asks a lot of questions. It's been terrific. In the short term, obviously, there are many questions need to be asked. We need to establish the, the safety of long-term use of a drug, which otherwise has been extremely safe, but uh, we don't know. No, people haven't been uh, treated uh, every day for long periods of time. Um, so there are these issues. Uh, there are uh, the issues of how long does it, does it work for a long time? Does the disease escape uh, the use? But in many ways, it's exactly the same as uh, the data we got um, some several years ago when we were looking at athletes that I was talking about who have the Epstar-Barr or the glandular fever virus or infectious mononucleosis virus underpinning a chronic fatigue illness. Uh, and if you treat them with an antiviral agent, uh, many of them, most of them, actually reversed their level of confusion or their cerebral um, cognitive issues, uh, the energy-activated fatigue that we talked about. So there's, I, I think... The, the possibility is that we're starting to look at mechanisms that can expand into a whole range of related disorders uh, of the chronic fatigue uh, syndrome that uh, is, is such a terrible problem uh, in, in society with so many patients. And this is, could be one of the good things that comes out of COVID, that we're thinking about pathophysiological mechanisms, disease processes, treatment modalities that could potentially yeah. apply to many not all but many chronic fatigue syndromes yes I, th th this is exactly my point that and my view that um we learn all the time and there's been such a focus and attention on, on covid uh, rightly so that um we can now say well we're learning this in this context uh can we generalize this to uh, other circumstances and uh, I, I firmly believe we can 
So you've been treating some patients with post-vaccine uh, injury, Robert. Now, we, we know that some of these are purely post-vaccine injury because they have spike protein antibodies in the absence of nucleocapsid protein antibodies. Um, some of them are long COVID because they've had the infection. And some of them, I hate to use the term, but are, are hybrid uh, hybrid post-vaccine and long COVID uh, sy syndromes. Now, um, your patients that you're seeing, we've got symptoms here like chest pain, passing out, fatigue, cloudy brain. Can you just tell us, in a sense, describe the, the suffering and the clinical features that these patients are presenting to you with? Well, there's a certain commonality. Uh, what we discussed the other day was that uh, long COVID has confused to an extent because it's a ragbag diagnosis. It's mm. somebody who has persistent symptoms three months after they've had COVID. Yeah. Uh, and um, we know that uh, at least two components uh, contribute to this. The first yeah. is they get a classic post-viral fatigue illness, which is characterised by a number of things, but the, the two standouts are uh, what I call energy-activated fatigue. Th their ceiling comes down uh, in terms of what they can do. If they push themselves, they, get, uh, they pay for it. They get yeah. several days of um, significant uh, uh, fatigue and illness. Mm -hmm. And the second is... Uh, they get brain fog or cognitive mm. defects, if you want to be a little bit more precise. Mm. Uh, where, and we, we talked about examples the, the other day of, of this. So um, there's a, then we talked about a second set of, of symptoms, which are due to more structural damage. And I think mm. the interesting thing that's, that's coming out of uh, certainly the observations of patients I'm seeing is that um, there may be a closer parallel with a lot of these symptoms um, that I'm not sure. C can people see the symptoms? Yes, they can see the screen, yeah. You can see what I can see. Okay. Yep. Um, well, uh, now, what I do with my patients, and um, some are better than others at doing this, but this, this is actually from a, a patient who um, uh, is happy. Oh, I've asked if, if I can without obviously mentioning uh, yeah. uh, his or her name. It's, it's, uh, it's a case study, isn't it? it it's a case study. Yeah. Uh, and now this is actually the data that the, uh, the patient brought mm. in uh, to my clinic uh, yesterday, actually. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, what I've asked them to do is to take the symptoms that concern them and yeah. give a scale zero to five, yeah. uh, where um, zero would be fantastic, you know, perfectly normal help, Five yeah. would be incapacitated, they can't get out of bed or, you know, as bad as they can imagine. Yeah. And then make up for each of them, take, take their symptoms and make up a scale that's relevant to them. Uh, and you can see this particular person, uh, she put uh, chest pain, uh, passing out. The, the particular person had POT syndrome, which mm -hmm. many people would know about, where uh, you're passing out all the time, you get autonomic nervous system involvement, um, a volume depletion of, of, of fluids in the body, and that comes together with postural hypertension, which means you stand up, you can faint. Just um, remind us what that stands for, Robert. Is uh, um, postural orthostatic... Uh, Tachycardic. Tachycardia. Tachycardic, uh, Tachycardic syndrome, isn't syndrome, it? Yeah. So in, in um, other words, when you stand up, your heart goes 90 to the dozen. That, that, that's right. And, and, and you feel dizzy and want to fall over again. you feel dizzy and fall over. So yeah, yeah. Um, what Horrible. they here is passing out, uh, yeah. which, which was a big issue with this particular patient. Uh, energy activated fatigue and what they're calling cloudy brain fog, which I call cognitive, um, uh, cognitive impairment. And so um, you can see that... Uh, so I on the 13th of December, there were... the. Four out of five, four out of five, five out of five. This particular patient... They were really pretty ill, weren't they? Extreme, extreme problems. Completely yeah. unable to leave home, get up, um, go to university, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, now, I, I think... Have you got that, uh, that graph that... Again, yeah, this we, is a graph that have. was drawn, drawn by the patient. This, this patient drew this think, graph, yeah. Yeah, one of the point, general points I'd like to make is... I'll make two points. The first mm. is that um, the interaction and working with the, the patient is part of the management team. And 
Um, this just shows you the extraordinary value of having a relationship where the patient understands this and participates. Now, this is not a graph I've drawn. Uh, it's a graph from those figures that you've just seen. And you can see um, dramatic changes. Now, what you're seeing is a cluster of four lines. Each mm -hmm. of those lines relate to the different symptoms that we went through yep. in that table. Now, um, I, I can't remember. I think I, I, I gave uh, that's them... That's the chest pain, passing out, fatigue, cloudy brain chest pain, pa So they're the classic symptoms of post-viral fatigue illness, plus chest pain, which you don't tend to get in, in people with Epstein-Barr virus. Mm. And I've always seen that as a more a structural issue. And what is fascinating to me, well, many things fascinating here, is that the symptoms all change more or less. Uh, you, know, you know, this is a single patient, a, but a very important single patient observation. And what you've seen there is basically a complete remission, complete improvement. A person who was incapacitated to a person who was functioning pr pretty much normally uh, after uh, five or six weeks of, of taking this particular drug. Now, um, the idea was to then stop the drug and see what happened. Uh, and as you can see, there's essentially 10 days or so where there's a maintenance of complete remission. And then mm -hmm. all the symptoms started coming back uh, pretty much after a couple of weeks to where they were before. Yeah. Now, so this, they, started, they started taking the ivermectin th 13th of December. That's correct. And they finished on the 2nd of? On the 2nd of January. And, you can see. Uh, and then uh, the symptoms started when they re-looked about the 7th, I think it is, isn't it, of January there? Yeah, 7th of January. Uh, yeah. And the 10th, uh, there's two uh, inputs. And you can see that the symptoms are clearly, um, this, on the 7th, they're fine. Uh, but by the 10th, the symptoms are starting to come back. And as you can see, you know, there's a fluctuating. This is an, a subjective test. Uh, and, uh, the point I, we were making at the beginning was this would be so easy for somebody who has access to patients and the time uh, and the resources to, to run a randomised controlled trial to do two things. Uh, one is to consolidate that this is real. Now, I, I'm showing you this as a typical outcome of all the patients I've treated. Uh, now, as I said, it's only six or eight people and some seem to get more complete benefit than others. Um, so, uh, but this is, I'm showing you this because it's uh, so, um, it's the best graph that I would... Well, it's totally stunning, Robert. We've got appalling, appalling symptoms, really high lines. Yeah. You start the ivermectin and you might expect it to affect one or two symptoms, but they all get dramatically better to the point where this, this patient basically resumed a normal life again. That, that's exactly right. And, and then and a, few, a few days after stopping taking the ivermectin, the symptoms came, came back again. That's right. And if you look at the, the symptoms are, are, are changing in parallel, which yeah. Strongly, yeah. Suggests, strongly suggests yeah. that what you're seeing is a common mechanism. Yeah. And, uh, as I said, the, the reason that I, I've been doing this is the studies by uh, my colleagues in, in the States in particular, mm. uh, showing this high affinity. What they did is they, they used um, computer uh, approach. There were four different groups did this. And they screened all sorts of uh, drugs available to see which one bound the tightest to spike protein. And this is called in silico. Yeah. Uh, many people will know what in vivo means. It means you do a study in the whole animal or the whole person. Yeah. In vitro means you do it in a test tube. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now, now all these clever people have in silico studies, which means you do computer screening. Beats the heck out of me, but I, I am familiar with the literature and it is very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. what, what, they measure the actual binding affinity. Yeah. And the drug that came out in all of these right above everything else was this ivermectin. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so um, the same person in, in, in the States uh, who I, I've got to know uh, was the one who did the uh, the studies in test tubes with the agglutination, the coming together of red yeah. cells, and how yeah. that was blocked by ivermectin, and then a number of uh, clinics in in America and South Africa uh, have done the studies uh, using um, oxygen saturation in people off oxygen. These weren't yeah. people taking oxygen, uh, yeah. and it, it just didn't make sense. Uh, I can remember the 
the data from the states that I, I was a bit familiar with. Um, yeah. How can you get reversion in these people in 24 hours? Because yeah. if you're suppressing inflammation, that's going yeah. to take days. And in fact, if you look at other treatments um, or other uh, natural history of reversion of oxygen saturation, you're mm -hmm. looking at best at five, seven, eight days. Yep. And this is occurring in 24 hours. It's, this is really quite exciting, Robert. Um, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm getting excited here because <laughs> it's, it's bringing together all sorts of things. Let, let me just run this past you and see if my thinking is correct here. So we have the spike protein and the ivermectin gums up the end of the spike protein. Right. That, that, that's basically like putting a dagger in its scabbard. Exactly. It, 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 it is de-weaponizing. That's right. And it stops the, it the doing spike, two things. The two spike things. protein, yeah. It stops the virus getting into the cell, so it stops yep. the infection, mm -hmm. and it stops the uh, spike protein um, and the virus once it's been infected, causing problems in the small vessels, blood vessels. Yeah. So this, this, and very important to realise it has the two benefits by binding and blocking. But the interesting thing this shows is that what else? I, I can't think of any mechanism other than a blocking mechanism that create this type of pattern, which, as I said, I've now seen in something uh, pretty much um, all the patients, the half dozen or so that I've treated, yeah. they've all claimed some level of benefit. Uh, and they all say that when they stop it after a few, a week or two, uh, the symptoms will start coming back. So, uh, I, I, guess, I guess in pharmacology we'd call this a competitive inhibition, wouldn't we? It's, it's like binding to that binding to that site and yes, the, yes, the, yes. The, the, the spike protein seems to be the thing that is binding gluing if you like red blood cells together so, so we get li little clumps of red blood cells now um I re i'm reminded of the work done by jackie stone in zimbabwe yeah well she was one of the three stars yeah and, and and she was working in a hospital in a poor area with no oxygen exactly so what she did was she gave the patients ivermectin and she had a reasonable sized cohort and the oxygen saturations all dramatically improved. Exactly. So what, what would be happening there is the, the spike protein was gluing all these cells together, giving you big clumps and, and the capillaries that go through the blood vessel, that, that go through the alveoli, the pulmonary vasculature is very, very tiny, tiny, in, 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 very small capillaries get blocked up really easily. So by taking off the glue that was gluing these red cells together they were small again they could then fit through the capillaries again that meant they could pick up the oxygen because the big clumps weren't fitting through the capillaries so you were getting a pulmonary hypoperfusion you weren't getting the blood supply going through your lungs it, it, it's absolutely exactly and and, and 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 that just reversed it in the oxygen saturations were picking up in hours and i was like you i said is this data right can this can it pick up so quickly but that mechanism makes perfect sense and and I've been talking to someone called Adam lately that I mentioned to you, Robert. And I do have his permission to talk about this. The video will be coming out soon. And for months, he suffered from intolerable, absolutely intolerable cramps in his legs. Extreme pain. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep for weeks. He, he was hallucinating because of the, the sleep deprivation. And that makes sense because... He was producing huge amounts of spike protein. We, we know that from his pathology results. Huge amounts of spike protein. And this is about, this is more than 18 months after his AstraZeneca vaccine. And again, th those, those clumps in combination with the inflammation of the small vessels in his legs could have been resulting in, in what, what we'd call an intermittent claudication, really, that, that he just wasn't getting the blood supply. He was getting these appalling pains for weeks on end. I haven't seen that in, uh, well, I, I can't remember any of my patients talking no. about it but it makes sense but it's, uh, the, same, it's the same mechanism it all kind of fits together yeah. doesn't it um certainly a, a num number of my patients have had what i what, what's called small fiber nerve fiber neuropathy where they get terrible burning legs mm. Uh, mm. and uh, i'll now make sure i ask them about cramps as yeah well. yeah um uh, adam had that as well but it, it, there was two distinct pains there was the burning neurological mm. neuropathic type pain yeah, we're familiar with from treating neuropathic pain, and there was the cramping, intermittent claudication type pain as well. So, um, two, two two mechanisms of pain, but yeah. both ultimately explained by the spike protein causing inflammation on the peripheral nerves, or the spike protein causing inflammation in the small blood vessels in combination with 
the uh, the clumping together of the red cells. It, it just makes perfect sense. Yes, what, what, what I think is interesting about this particular graph is that uh, one of the components of these fatigue illness, uh, which we call POT syndrome, is this uh, business of, of fainting, uh, and dropping of blood pressure, the autonomic uh, nervous system, which has been nearly refractory to pretty much every treatment. And, and what I find very exciting is that the <clears throat> components of this particular person's uh, post-vaccine um, illness um, is reversion of the POTS, the postural hypertension, uh, which I, I haven't seen that in any of the patients over the years that I've looked after with POTS syndrome so dramatically uh, with any other particular treatment. So uh, it, it's really consolidating the idea that there's an antigen driving fatigue illnesses uh, and if you can block or get rid of that antigen in some way, uh, then you can get remission of the symptoms. Which do, 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 do we have like a path? You know, we've got like a pathological mechanism there for the the hypoxia in acute COVID. For the clumping, I mean, do we have like a pathological mechanism for the POTS that would make sense in context of other illnesses, perhaps? No, I, I, I you know, it was only when I, I, I saw this graph yesterday that that I, I said, wait, wait a second, you know, this is also not just fatigue and um, and the, uh, the, the cerebral symptoms, it's also the POTS component that seems to be benefiting. Um, I mean, I think that, that you, you have to say, I can't think of another mechanism. And overnight, I, 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 I asked the question of my colleague in the States that's been doing all this work on uh, the blocking of ivermectin. I said, can you think? of another mechanism. And I, I got back a very nice email uh, this morning simply saying, oh, gee, isn't that exciting? But uh, no comment about some alternate explanation. So uh, I'd can be I, very- can I, can, I, can, I make one up, can I make one up and run it past you, Robert, please? Yes, sure. We hadn't, we hadn't planned this at all. This is, this is just- <laughs> we So um, we, 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 know, we know that um, the spike protein causes inflammation of the peripheral nerves in this appalling burning electrical shock type feeling in the arms and the legs the, the peripheral neuropathy caused by the inflammation caused by the spike protein presumably uh, attacking the myelin sheath perhaps primarily because there are cases of demyelination the myelin being the insulation around the nerve cells that could be being attacked well in in diabetes you can get a similar condition you can get peripheral neuropathy but in diabetes you can get also autonomic neuropathy because the, autono the autonomic nervous system is working on nerve fibers. Vagus nerve, for example, is an autonomic nerve. It's, it's working on, on nerve fibers in the same way. So it's quite reasonable that spike protein could be attacking the fibers or the myelin of the autonomic nerves in the same way that it attacks the myelin and, the fi and or the fibers in the peripheral nerves. Just that in the peripheral nerves, it causes pain. In the autonomic nerves, it could be causing this autonomic dysregulation. It could be the same mechanism. Is that oh, ludicrous? I, 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 think, I think that's probably so. Um, I'm not sure that too many of the autonomic nerves are actually got myelin sheaths, but but certainly the okay. the, uh, the the mechanism of expression of spike protein and the body's immune system attacking that in different organs uh, is very real, and certainly is is a good explanation. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting that. The parallels with diabetes are interesting there, the autonomic yeah. disorder in diabetes. Very interesting. And, mm. and I think the, what I think we're saying here is that, that when a spike protein is expressed in this way, it can induce two different types of immune responses. One which leads to the classic chronic fatigue symptoms of fatigue and um, cognitive impairment. And the second, which is more structural damage to nerves or heart or brain or whatever uh, and both of these are related to an immune response to an exposed spike protein so by blocking that spike protein you potentially can ameliorate the problems from both those different uh, pathways if you like of of disease so pathway one would be the direct toxicity effect of the spike protein like sticking the knife in people um, to, to the, the, the second component would be the immune, immunological response to the spike protein. Yeah, that, yeah I, 
uh, there may be three. <laughs> oh, yeah. What I'm really saying is there's two different types of immune response. There's an immune response that leads to chronic fatigue syndrome, yeah. and there's an immune response that leads to damage, which yeah. is structural, um, like damaging nerves, damaging heart, damaging other organ systems, skin, whatever. Um, and then toxicity of the spike planet. Yeah. So, then so Adam, Adam, who I was talking to yesterday, he had um, the, he had a muscle biopsy, and he actually found complement in in the muscle. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, deposited it around the blood vessel. And just think what the complement could do to the myocytes; it would just drill holes in them, and they could explode. It's horrible, yeah. horrible thought. Well, the complement would be deposited because you'd have uh, an IgG antibody directed against the expressed spike protein, and we know IgG antibody. Uh, the IgG3 subsets particularly bind the, the, the complement and the complement does, that's the innate immune system. That is the hand grenade going off. The, the uh, pin of the hand grenade is the IgG antibody. The explosion is the complement induced uh, uh, amplified series of uh, reactions that lead to the inflammation and damage. I always find treatments much more satisfying or, or to put it another way reassuring that they are correct if there is this sort of pathophysiological pharmacodynamic explanation that makes sense and, and and what we've just described really is a complete not quite a complete picture but but certainly a lot of uh, mutually consistent uh, mechanisms that really could explain this dramatic improvement in your patients but I'm a bit disappointed that it only lasted for a few days without the ivermectin, uh, Robert. What do we do about that? Well, well I'll, I'll just come back on, on the mechanism and symptom Please. comment that you made, because I think Please. it's a very, very important comment. Um, uh, several colleagues and myself at the moment are just finishing a, a paper we're about to publish, uh, which we think is very important because uh, it's, uh, we're talking about how ivermectin has been a roller coaster ride, that when it first began... Uh, no one wanted to know about it, um, and, and to be fair, the the evidence was sort of coming together, but it wasn't crystal clear, or well, not crystal clear enough. Uh, mm. The problem was that argument was about the mechanism. Uh, RDME, the mechanisms you're describing won't occur with the drug dose you're using. Now, with this new concept that's come through of blocking of the um, of the uh, uh, spike, spike protein. That has changed things because this is occurring at levels that you can attain uh, with, um, with treatment. Uh, and so what has happened with ivermectin is that it suddenly moved from uh, a, a drug that for whatever purpose has been uh, pilloried in, in a most amazing fashion. Uh, and all of a sudden we've now got a very clear mechanism that makes mm. just the point you're making. Uh, mm. that correlates with the symptomatology mm. uh, of infection and ischemia through the small vessels not getting oxygenated, uh, etc. So uh, that was very, very important. And, of course, uh, there's been a progressive accumulation, uh, exciting accumulation of clinical data. So you've now got a much stronger argument that can be made, and this is the point. Uh, of, of the paper because we want to get it published in a mainline journal so doctors can start uh, asking questions just as this data which is just data on a few patients um, is not telling you to go out and, and treat everyone this way but hey here is some evidence some data that makes sense in the context of what we understand and maybe has an important role to play but we want people now to pick this up and do yeah. the appropriate tests because we we don't know you, the point you the last point you made mm. is so important that we don't know how long it works mm. if you're blocking it it may be perfectly all right to to give people ivermectin what what i'm doing is titrating in these patients to yes. get way down to the smallest amount of ivermectin given as least frequently because we know ivermectin has a very long half-life it lives mm. in the body for quite a period of time uh, mm. so uh, and we know that people who use the drug <coughs> prophylactically uh, will take it once a week for a long period of time so we, we need to <coughs> consolidate <coughs> those safety issues 
and uh, uh, and, um, uh, and and work out the dynamics. So, you know, we've got a way to go. So hopefully you'll come. It may you may get to a situation we don't know, but this would be nice if you could take three milligrams of ivermectin once a week, and that might be enough to keep symptoms at bay. We don't know yet. Well, I, I'm hoping that within a couple of months I'll have some handle on that with at least yeah. the people I'm dealing with because they're now on reducing hydration. Uh, you know, what I'm doing is uh, saying, OK, uh, take it every second day for a week or two. Uh, we know that uh, if it's going to rebound, it'll do so within two mm -hmm. weeks. If everything's OK, take it every third day, fourth day. And the idea is to get to a dose which people are, are, are comfortable with uh, in a longer term why, why at the same time monitoring uh, any potential side effects uh, i'm actually optimistic you will be able to get the dose down because of the high affinity of uh, the do. ivermectin for the spike protein I so you so you, you give a little bit of ivermectin and it kind of zooms in to the spike protein yeah uh, and, and, and so, that's a very good point I, I must go back to my my colleagues in america and say uh we know about the affinity <coughs> what's yeah. the duration what's the duration yeah yeah. Good point. <laughs> but but the trouble is people we're probably going to need to keep giving it on a regular basis because the ivermectin is clogging up the spike protein i mean are we optimistic that the ivermectin could have some intracellular effect in reducing spike protein production or is that too much to ask no, i think this was going way back to the the early days in 2021 when uh, a number of sites, and this is the great advantage of uh, these protecting type uh, pro uh, um, substances that come from biological sources, mm. uh, is that they're there Complete, to protect completely the natural bacterial products. That's right. They're, they're there to, to protect the microbe or, or the plants. Yep. You know? And they what they what they do is they make the cell uh, unpopular for the virus to replicate mm. by hitting mm. a whole lot of different sites. Mm. And those who were critical of, of ivermectin said, well, you know, what dose do you need? And, uh, and it really got into a sort of a, a bit of a bun fight. When, and it was only when this, this new data came out, people said, well, you know, the fate are complete. But we mustn't forget that the drug does have these sites where it stops the generation of, of cytopathic cytokines. Uh, it stops the various pathways uh, that are... Uh, highly productive of of damage in different ways. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure this is playing a role at the moment because of the immediacy of the effect, the dependence on the ivermectin being present, and the rebound and and the logic of of blocking mm. expression uh, of the spike protein. If I was one of your patients, Robert, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't care a hoot about all that. All I would know is that you've given me my life back. Just because, because you're an independent clinician that's prepared to try a new treatment, but based based on decades of experience, based on the knowledge that you're dealing with a very safe drug. Yeah, I, I think this gets to, to a, a point that's for, very close to my heart. And yeah. what broke my heart uh, when, yeah. in my country, when uh, the disease arrived back in early 19... Uh, uh, yeah, 2020. 2020, um, yeah. 2020. I've got to get my got to get my centuries right oh um, i have that problem I all the could time not <laughs> use, i could not use a drug that i'd been using for 50 years i won't mention its name you'll never get published now which works which works no uh, i think we can say hydroxychloroquine you know, these days well well the same thing <laughs> with like we've got a new mechanism for hydroxychloroquine uh i take it myself it's terrific drug um, There's a drug, the drug that as, as, as one of the most senior doctors, quite honestly, in Australia, you, you've been prescribing that for 50 years. And then someone tells me in some government office somewhere comes and says, no, no, doctor, I know better. 50 years experience. Puh. You know, it, it, it's, just, it's just unbelievable. The sheer arrogance. Yeah. Of people who yeah. Are, who yeah. are not, not medically trained and those who are medically trained sit on committees all day. And haven't got a clue. And it's like it's, it's like being me being on a flight, barging into the cockpit, saying to the pilot, "No, no, no, no! You press that button, then you do that one, then you pull the stick that way." Yeah. Trust me, I know these things because I know nothing. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's just madness. Let, let, let's be careful we don't get too carried away because <laughs> you know, there are some crazy people around to do crazy things. Uh, what I'm saying is that 
Um, there is, there is. And we made this point the other day that I'm an immunologist uh, and I look at the mechanism of a disease. And so I'm trying to design in every patient. Every patient's different and yeah. they require a, a different approach. And so constantly uh, immunologists, clinical immunologists, are looking at what is going wrong in this patient as a process and how can we change that for the betterment of the patient. Now, no one's done, no one's done a, a randomised controlled trial costing 50 million uh, pounds or dollars uh, to, to prove that no one ever will because these drugs are repurposed drugs, they're, they're out of, no one's making any money out of them, um, ivermectin's the same. Uh, and so the big pharma companies hate, they hate people like me. Uh, probably hate people like you too, John. And um, I think we're both on a list somewhere. Well, I, well, I, I, well, well, I happen to, I happen to know I, I am, but that's a separate matter. Right. I'm, I'm quite amazed. <laughs> but uh, maybe they think that, uh, that I'm, I'm too old or something like that. But, but the, the bottom line is that experienced doctors every day use repurposed drugs, yep. um, trying to make a difference to people who are suffering from a range of illnesses that the classic drugs are not helping. Um, now, uh, these repurposed drugs that come from plant and biological sources uh, have been around for billions of years. Yep. Uh, we, we know their safety profile pretty much. We, we, we know uh, what they do and how they work. Uh, and uh, I've been using hydroxychloroquine, as I think I pointed out in a, something I wrote recently that I worked out I'd written something like 25,000 prescriptions and I don't own a share in the company. I don't even know who makes it. Um, the, um, 25,000 And many of these people are people who, um, well, I, I can give you an example. I can remember seeing a couple of patients that had a condition called sarcoidosis. Yes. And they, they were going nowhere. They, we were using all these cytotoxics and things. Uh, and I said, well, look, th this I think is the yep. process. Um, let's um, let's see what happens with hydroxychloroquine. And, and both these patients had significant improvement. And about a year later, out came a paper by, by a paediatrician saying, hey, well, I'm using hydroxychloroquine. Look, this is my, I've done a series of these. Uh, and it makes sense. So um, this is the way medicine should be done. Uh, yeah. But, you know, there's a compulsion on you to ensure that you're monitoring the safety, you're monitoring the mechanism, uh, and, and you don't get carried away, you don't mm -hmm. use this as a blanket uh, approach to things. Um, but that's certainly the way I've practiced medicine for all my working 50 years. Absolutely. I mean, talking as, as more so, sober scientists at the moment, what we've just done is we've postulated a hypothesis, and a hypothesis is a testable mm -hmm. statement. This could be tested and in our views, of course, should be tested and uh, it's up to doctors and maybe university departments around the world to, to take this up and start testing it in their own patients using their own clinical judgment. Well, the reason, the reason you're saying that, John, is so important is that you go to any of these, uh, the big hospitals now have long COVID clinics with long mm. lists of people in them. People can't get into them. Uh, I hear stories from all sorts of sources uh, about that. But when you go to the clinic, uh, what do they do? Uh, at the moment, basically nothing. Um, they say that, you know, um, 30, 40% of you, the symptoms will go in the next 12 months, um, maybe a few more. But 30% uh, are still going to have those symptoms. Um, uh, you know, I'm talking to a couple of people at the moment about other ways in which maybe we can change. I, I, I think the microbiome in the gut is looming uh, as part of a connecting system. Uh, very exciting sort of work. Uh, what can we do to, to change those outcomes? So we're, we've talked about one, one system that makes sense, uh, comes from straight science, uh, and um, as a result of a patient-physician patient relationship, uh, we've been able to work a system uh, that is looking exciting. I mean, we did say this would be a short video, Robert, but I do have one more question. G g given that idea, do you think there's a role for your um, oral, um, or oral attenuated bacterial? I hate, I hate, I'm not using the term vaccine, yeah. but uh, no, I, we, we, I don't want to get too much into that today. But 
Um, we did talk once. Um, I've spent many years looking at the ways in which you can adjust the way the mucosa of the airways uh, handles a virus that they breathe in and um, uh, come up with the idea of what we call immune resilience. Um, and the question, very simply, is if 100 people get COVID, uh, 97, 98 of those people will do very well. One or two will go to hospital. One might even die. So uh, these people, if you look at them, they all look the same. They, they say, I mean, obviously we know there are predisposing factors that make people get worse COVID, but many of these people look exactly the same. What is the difference? Uh, and the main difference is the way in which that virus is handled. Uh, and you, you, there are ways now in which we can change the resilience so that we can shift, de-risk, if you like, take away the risk of somebody by moving their resilience, their capacity to handle in the first instance their mucosal immune response uh, by making the delivery of the T-cells. Remember that the airways get their immunity from the gut. Uh, the gut has little things called pairs patches, which we talked mm -hmm. about, that deliver uh, these T-lymphocytes. And these T-lymphocytes uh, shore up the, the immunity. And in some people, about 25% of people, they don't do it very well. And you can make that work better by feeding more of the stimulus, which is some of the microbiome that uh, is being swallowed all the time. So you make the swallowing mm -hmm. process work better. It, it goes back to the early days I can remember when uh, I was doing a, a term as a registrar in respiratory medicine, and there was a big argument over, uh, should you tell people who have got uh, chronic lung disease with, uh, with a lot of sputum, should they swallow it or should they spit it? <laughs> And uh, I think now we know you swallow it, uh, the mm -hmm. takeaway lesson. Yeah, I mean, of course, if that had been given before, that would have reduced the severity of the initial COVID infection and that could reduce the probability of long COVID. It wouldn't work against the vaccines, of course. No, um, it, it's a different system. Yeah, and we want, we, of course, I mean, I assume we would still want to optimise vitamin D and things like that. Well, absolutely, absolutely. There's no, there's no single answer. Uh, yeah. It's, Mod. Vitamin D uh, has had an enormous amount of work done in recent years, really. Huh? Um, you, you and I, John, can remember that if you don't have enough vitamin D, you get rickets or osteomalacia if you're an adult, uh, and that's long gone. Um, Slightly more. Than, well, it's still there, but there's a slight, few things added to it. <laughs> Excellent video, by the way, by Dr. David Grimes on this very channel just the other week. Do, do watch it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, that's Absolutely very great good. stuff. Yeah, um, Rob, Robert. Um, I'm sorry, if th this is the last question. I've just thought of it. Is there a role for hydroxychloroquine and zinc in in long COVID? Because it, I'm just thinking, if the spike protein is being produced in the cell, you get more zinc into the cell. We know that zinc is antiviral. Hydroxychloroquine will will channel gate the zinc into the cell. Is there a possible yeah. role for the for, the, for I, I, those two in combination? I don't know the answer. I can tell you what I've done. Um, there may be, uh, there may be in post-viral long COVID because these people presumably have replication of the virus. Um, whether they that has any role in the post-vaccine variant of, of long COVID, mm. I don't know. What, what, my what I when I started uh, some months ago, um, getting a number of these patients. I started treating them with both hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the ivermectin, uh, then the ivermectin, well, around that time, the ivermectin blocking story came out uh, and it was very persuasive. Uh, and so what I've now done is basically stopped the hydroxychloroquine and stuck with the, the single ivermectin. So I don't know the answer. Uh, I understand the logic. Um, and, um, you know, uh, there, now there's a, there's a great project for someone to do. Oh, there's PhDs and MDs flying out of this video uh, by the dozen, Robert. I, I agree with you completely. To have to study one variable at a time, i.e. the ivermectin, mm. uh, is much more straightforward than having several variables all going at the, at oh, the same I, time. I agree. And, and when, I, yeah, when, when I started seeing, I mean, it breaks your heart to see the, these places. Uh, I know some of them watch your channel, so I hope they're not, and I'm certainly not referring to anyone specifically, um, in fact, most of them uh, who come my way come via your channel, which is, I, I've had to start, send nice emails saying, I just can't cope. 
uh, because I, I, a lot of other things I do. But we need um, we need all the doctors and nurse practitioners and all the people around the world to step yeah, up to yeah. the plate here, don't we, and start well, well, start well, treating. Th these patients are very very smart people, uh, and yeah. they they follow the story. They follow your your channel. They follow the story. Um, one uh, one patient who I'm sure will be watching, and she won't he he or she won't be mind me men um, had such problems they decided that ivermectin would be a thing to treat. And you can get the cream quite easily for rosacea, which is transdermal, called. yeah. And um, they started using, they worked out how much cream to put on to get a certain dose, which actually turned out to be a pretty similar dose to what I'm giving by mouth. And um, th this person had been to hospitals, had been in hospital. No one she, uh, had terrible neuropathies. Um, yeah. And... She now copes um, quite well and won't use anything but, but her cream because she's quite convinced it works. Now, I'm not suggesting this is the way to go in any way, but I'm, I'm just saying that patients are smart. Uh, and uh, they're smart. I always work on the, I always tell my patients they're smarter than I am, and I, I mean it. Um, mm. And um, she's well, worked out how to individualize and optimize her own personal care. That's, that's abs wonderful. absolutely because the doctors had not come up with anything that was helping. Yep. So if you have had similar experiences, do let us know in the comments, because Robert and I were talking about this. The comments are really important because they are a form of qualitative research. Yeah. What, what we find reading the comments is common themes emerge. And uh, if anyone wants to do a project in, in, in the comments, they are in the public domain. It would be wonderful if anyone did do a qualitative analysis on that. But we really do need nurses and doctors and pharmacists around the world to step up to the plate and realise that we have postulated the hypothesis that this is a treatable condition. Uh, I, I'll just say two things about that. I, mm, please. We, we live in a different world. Um, the, the technologies are changing um, uh, the, you know, the randomised controlled trial has been pushed back uh, as something that is very expensive, done by big pharma companies to register. Uh, great things, but they have defects, as we well know. Um, and there are a variety of ways have emerged which have validity in terms of producing evidence. And John and I were talking about, well, wait a second, look at the data that's coming forward. I, I had a quick look through some of the the comments of our last talk and mm. I was blown away by, by the number of people who are having similar problems. Uh, you know, we think that something's pretty rare because we see two or three cases, but then you see people... Uh, it, it reminds me of a condition, John, uh, if you've got a second. Um, yeah, of course. There's a condition in women called vulvo, uh, vulvovaginal candidiasis. Now, these yes. are women who get thrush six thrush. or more times a year. Now, I thought that was a rare disease because I talked to my gynecological colleagues uh, and I, I got interested because I felt there was a way we could treat this. And, uh, and no one at the time understood why they got it. But these women always get their thrush in the week before their period. Yeah. And that, that says, and we knew, we knew that T cells in the blood um, don't get through into the vaginal um, and cervical mucosa. mucosa very efficiently in that last period, the hormonal changes blocked the T cells getting out. And the so, hormonal changes change the consistency of the mucus. Exactly. So I said, well, well, maybe there's a reduction of the number. And so that this comes a clinical problem when they can't get through into the, into the tissues where they're needed. But then my point is this, that, that I thought, well, I won't do uh, any research on this because my gynecological friends tell me, that this is rare, they never see it. Well, the bottom line was they don't see it because they weren't doing anything to help these patients. And if you talk to the general practitioners, they say, oh, I've got lots of these patients. And it turns out that something like 5%, 5% of women have vulvovaginal candidiasis uh, and they get six or more, 5%, one in 20 women, uh, get six or more episodes of thrush a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we did look and we did find that this was exactly what happened, that the T cells, they, this particular group genetically had a lower pool of the right sort of T cells to get into the tissues. Uh, and, you know, we came up with various ways in which we could boost that number of, of T cells. So uh, I think that the, the, point, the point is that the primary care doctor 
is the person who really has an idea of how important and how common problems are that we people who work in a, an ivory tower get to see what the patient and the doctor feels maybe we can contribute to. But, and what COVID has done um, and what post-COVID has done is that it's force, force-fed, if you like, these people because there's been nothing, nothing to help them. And so they're appearing in great numbers uh, in, in clinics potentially like mine, although I, I, I see very few patients these days. Yep. But the message is take this information to your own doctor mm. and optimise the care with your own doctor. And now, now in Australia, for example, where ivermectin is allowed to be prescribed, yes, I would be hopeful. And uh, the situation in the states um, is is probably more promising, depending on the states. The situation in the UK, doctors are still. I don't think you get a. I think you'd be struggling to find a doctor to prescribe ivermectin in, in the UK. But the point is, this has to change because we need to help our patients. And are you saying, terms, John, that in the UK it's legal, but the doctor? been so narrative brainwashed yeah uh, um lo lots and lots of people have told me that they've asked their doctor to prescribe ivermectin yeah, and they the won't do it. Have, the doctors have refused and, and the same will occur in this country yeah which is just you know if, if 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 it's if there's very little risk and there's a potential massive benefit risk benefit analysis you know to me it's basic stuff yeah and it's really disappointing but it will change because eventually the evidence, if our, if our hypothesis is substantiated in multiple cases, it, of course it may be rejected, in which case we'll accept that and go back to the drawing board, but we, we don't think it will it's be. It's a one-off thing that, that, that you can't, re, re, we don't know. We, 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 we really don't think so, but it's a hypothesis. If it's tested and it's, and it's, it, it's substantiated in multiple instances, then the authorities can only deny the truth for so long. Eventually, the same as they did with Helicobacter, the same as they did with thalidomide, the same as they did with tobacco, the same as they did with asbestos, the same as they did with the infected blood scandal, the same as they did with the post office workers in my country, eventually they're going to have to admit it. Yeah. And patients will be helped. And we're really sorry about the delay. Well, thanks very much, John. I think. I think what I'm sure your viewers appreciate is that you're providing a, it's fascinating, a, a sort of new platform for asking questions. And the, the idea of evidence-based communication, uh, which is what your programs are based on, I, I think are exciting and interesting. And it's becoming very interesting to see where they go. Um, because uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if someone said, hey, I'm going to do a PhD on analysing uh, um, data that I get from comments uh, following evidence based discussions and, and, and it could be done there's enough there's enough material there and yeah we could a lot we of could, material we, we could work out triangulations and all sorts the, the mind boggles with that but what amazes me is that the leading doctors in the world choose to come and talk to me I just find it humbling and fantastic genuinely it's it's amazing so well I can tell you why it's very simple <laughs> you're the only um, a medium that bases everything you do on evidence. Yeah. And that's the difference. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. Yeah, that's, that's good. We will keep trying to do that. But for now, Professor Clancy, as always, amazing insights. Thank you very much for coming on. Great pleasure.